What is oil? Where does it come from? And how did it get there? Well, what we think happened is that many millions of years ago, before the Earth took on the geography we know today, marine plants and living creatures died off in the usual way and sank to the bottom. In time, they were buried under layers of silt and sediment. As it accumulated, the sediment was compressed under its own weight, hardened and became rock. As the earth cooled, the layers of rock contracted and buckled into their present forms. But the remains of the plants and creatures hadn't just disappeared, they'd been changed by a long chemical process into oil. Certain kinds of rock are porous like a sponge, and into these the oil could move and be held in soak, as it were. But other kinds of rock are solid and impermeable, and when it reaches these layers, the oil is trapped. An oil reservoir begins to form, held in the porous rock. Over millions of years, the seabed where it first began to form may have changed out of recognition. It may now be a vast desert, a stretch of Arctic tundra perhaps, or it may be under the seas we know today. But under land or sea, it is nearly always hidden, trapped well below ground, so we have to find it. Thank you. How? Now and then, it may have left clues in rocks on the surface, like this fossilized shell. But the real detective work concerns something we can't see, the lie of the rocks underground. This is a geophone being planted in the desert of Oman. A whole string of them, in fact. Geophones are sensitive instruments capable of picking up echoes from shock waves sent down from the surface and reflected by the rocks below. The echoes are picked up and recorded and a pattern emerges. This is called seismic survey. At sea, the shock wave is produced by compressed air. Either way, this is what you get. A profile of the rock strata below the surface. From this profile, the geologists can tell whether or not there's any possibility of oil being there. But the only way to find out for certain is to drill an exploration well, and that can cost over a million pounds. So massive calculations have to be made on a computer and the results carefully evaluated before such an expensive decision can be taken. Here, in the South China Sea off Borneo, the decision has been taken. And so a huge floating drilling platform is towed out and positioned over the chosen spot in the rock strata below. The drilling rig consists of a tower over a hundred feet tall, equipped with heavy lifting gear. The drilling tool itself is a rotating bit which bites into the rock as it turns. It turns at the end of a long string of hollow pipes, which can be screwed together and lengthened as the well gets deeper. At the top of the string, a square sectioned pipe fits into a turntable on the rig floor, and this turns the bit in the well. The drillers control the drilling by controlling the weight of the lifting gear pressing down on the bit. As the drill bites deeper, the drilling string is lengthened. The well is scoured by a special fluid, rather like mud, which is pumped down the inside of the pipe and comes up again on the outside. 
bringing with it all the chippings of the rock the drill is going through. These are watched closely by the geologists and petroleum engineers. Every so often, the bit has to be changed. And this is a tremendous job. The whole length of the drilling string, probably several thousand feet of it, has to be pulled up out of the well, broken down into 90-foot lengths, and stacked up in the rig tower. Then when the bit has been changed, it all has to be put back down the well again. We call the whole operation a round trip. We have to do this quite frequently, not only because the bits wear out, but also because different kinds of bit have to be used in drilling through different kinds of rock, so that no single bit can ever do the whole job. A round trip is a long, non-stop job going on from one shift to another often in a climate that's hot and sticky. At last, the worn bit comes into view. The new one stands ready. That one, how much did it make? About a thousand feet. A thousand feet. Now, look at this one. The bit is changed, and down goes the drilling string. 90 foot length by 90 foot length. Round the clock and round the world, the drilling goes on. As night falls in Borneo, it's still blazing afternoon in Southeast Arabia. Misty morning in the North Sea, as the helicopter brings in the relief shift to a rig that's drilling not for oil, but for natural gas, which is a close relation of oil. And in the Arctic, tomorrow's icy dawn has already begun. As the drill bites down to its target, core samples of the rock are brought up by a special bit, rather like an apple corer, and examined carefully for traces of oil. The chances of finding oil at all are only one in 10. So after weeks of sweat, a few drops of oil can be a pretty marvelous sight. Away they go for analysis. And if the signs are encouraging enough, there'll be a lot more wells to be drilled in the same area. On dry land, a completed well is quite a neat, unobtrusive affair of pipes and valves. Soon it will be connected by a flow line to a production centre, where surplus gas is taken off and the oil made safe for transport. From an inland oil field, the oil may first have to travel a long way by pipeline, sometimes hundreds of miles, to reach the storage tanks of an oil port. An offshore oil field looks rather different, with all the well heads and production centers standing up above water on steel structures known as jackets. But it works in just the same way, and it's all connected up by flow lines running across the seabed. The sea has always been the main highway connecting the world's oil fields with their principal markets. And nowadays, the oil tankers are the biggest and the most numerous ships afloat. This is Mycia, 1,076 feet long, 154 feet wide, carrying 200,000 tons of crude oil from the Middle East. In its crude state, just as it comes out of the ground, oil is a useless mixture of very useful substances. So to obtain useful products from it, we must first unscramble the mixture. And this is done in the refinery. 
The mixture in any given quantity of oil consists of varying proportions of gases, gasoline, kerosene, diesel oil, fuel oil, lubricating oil, and solids such as bitumen. These proportions are known as fractions. And as each fraction has a different weight and a different boiling point, they can be separated out by means of distillation. In the refinery, this is carried out in tall vessels known as fractionating columns. The oil is heated at the base of the column and each fraction vaporizes as its boiling point is reached. The vapor rises up the column, cools as it rises, condenses back into a liquid and is caught by trays as it does so. The gas and gasoline fractions being the lightest go to the top of the column Further down we get the kerosene, diesel oil, fuel oil, lubricating oil and bitumen fractions, each of them thicker and heavier than the last. But there's more to a refinery than simply distilling oil into its natural fractions. There are local requirements to be considered. A big city may want as much as 50% of its oil in the form of gasoline. The natural gasoline fraction in crude oil is only about 14%. The only way to make up the difference is to take some of the other fractions and change their chemistry. In one such process, a powder is mixed with a selected fraction at a very high temperature in a vessel called a catalytic cracker. This fraction reacts with the powder so that its chemistry is changed into that of gasoline. In this and many other ways, the refinery engineers can tailor the output of the refinery to the demands of the local market. From the refineries, we ship the products out by an elaborate system of transport to wherever they're needed, all over the world, and in the right quantities. In a developing country like Malaysia, there may be a big demand for gases derived from oil for cooking and lighting in people's homes. Busy airports will need very large quantities of jet fuel as well as lubricants. The ordinary motorist wants gasoline and lube oils of varying grades and these must be brought to his very roadside or even his waterfront. In industrial countries, the biggest customer for oil products is industry itself, using them not only to power and lubricate its own plant, but to generate even more power in the form of electricity. Nowadays, oil products reach far beyond the factory, the car engine or the jet. There is a product of oil which can be used to strengthen the roots of the plants we eat and to increase the fertility of the soil. And this has led to the worldwide manufacture of artificial fertilizers. Allied to the fertilizers, oil has produced other chemicals that kill the insect pests that compete with us for everything we grow. The result has been called the Green Revolution, a revolution against that most terrible and ancient of tyrannies, famine. Neither the Green Revolution nor a number of other major developments of recent years would have happened without a sustained effort in research. Research must always be ahead of the game, designing on a miniature scale the major products of perhaps 10 years hence always concerned with the very nature of materials and phenomena. The results are many and various. We see an enormous increase in power outputs, going hand in hand with a determined attack on smoke pollution, helping to make clean, fresh air compatible with jobs and industry. 
The chemistry of oil has proved so flexible that we've been able to derive from it a whole new range of materials, the plastics. They're very light and easy to mould and very cheap. A few years ago, they didn't even exist. Other areas of research have led to the development of synthetic paints, equally useful to artists on the one hand and to industry on the other. To synthetic fibres, strong enough to hold a tanker. Synthetic rubber, good enough for the tyres of a high-performance car and many other products. For this one aircraft, oil will have provided the fuel that powers it, lubricants, hydraulic fluids, many of its furnishings and fittings, and may well have contributed the tyres and the runway surface they're landing on. It has even helped grow the food served on board. All these things and many others come from oil, the mineral on which the whole world depends and which is won with so much effort in so many distant places. <laughs>